There is a common experience among every child of God. We might call it the struggle. The struggle between the old man and the new man. The struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The Apostle Paul experienced the struggle and was led by the Holy Spirit to record it here and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, where he says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that they, you cannot do the things that ye would. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever known what to do but didn't do it? Have you ever desired to do the right thing and you ended up doing the wrong thing? Have you ever been at that point in your life where you didn't want to and you knew you shouldn't, but you did? I'm glad Paul wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because it gives me hope and motivation. Because I figure if the greatest missionary preacher of all time found himself in the struggle with probably the same things that we struggle with, that I must not be an anomaly. I'm not the only one, amen? And you're not the only one. Remember, the devil wishes to defeat us. And he will do this by deceiving us and enlisting the world to entice us and the flesh to betray us. We can avoid the trap if we recognize the path that we're on and take steps to reroute. There are several stages, I think, through which a Christian can go in his or her way to defeat. And so the message this morning would be entitled, The Struggle, and a subtitle might be this, How You Can Go From Victory to Defeat in Three Easy Steps. And that's exactly what will happen, dear Christian, if we're not careful. I think there are three stages which a Christian can find themselves in on the way to defeat. And the first stage I call the frustration stage. Or we might call it the why did I do that stage. I believe God's greatest servants go through this stage. Abraham went through it. You remember when he lied about his wife being his sister? Remember that? Do you think Abraham might have asked himself, why did I do that? Do you think when God revealed it to the king and, and, and now the king had to go and rebuke Abraham, that Abraham might have said, oh, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Moses went through it when he struck the rock the second time instead of just speaking to it. I believe I would imagine that as he struck that rock, he knew when he was striking it he shouldn't. But he struck it out of frustration, didn't he? And I'm sure somewhere along the line, he said, what in the world was I thinking? Why did I do that? I think of Jacob who cheated his brother. I think of David who lusted. And we could go on through the scripture with others who we're in this stage of frustration with themselves. Sooner or later, every new believer comes to the stark realization that he or she is still a sinner. Saved by grace, yes. But a sinner nonetheless. If we do not handle the frustration stage of the Christian experience, we will eventually fall into stage number two, which we'll look at in a minute. But... The frustration stage is experiencing frustration with ourselves. It's at this stage when we ask the question, why did I do that? Or, why can't I just? And you can fill in the blank. The Apostle Paul said it best in verses 15 through 19. Let's read that again. He said this, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Have you ever allowed anything out of your mouth and said, oh, what I say that for? You ever get frustrated with yourself? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, and when he's talking about the flesh here, he's talking about that there, there are several uses of the word flesh in the New Testament. One is talking about flesh that you eat. One is talking about flesh of the human body. Another one is talking about flesh of the fleshly nature. The human nature, the sinful nature. And that's what he says, For I know that in me that is in my fleshly, sinful, carnal nature dwelleth no good thing. He says, For how to perform that which is good I find not. In our flesh we do not find the ability to perform that which is good. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now Paul is not excusing sin. He's not justifying sin, but he is understanding sin. Can you understand the difference? Somebody help me here. Does somebody understand the difference? I don't believe you. You're looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Paul's saying there's no excuse for our sin. There's no justification for our sin. But we have to understand as we are sinners saved by grace and we will and do sin to one degree or another at some time or another in our Christian life. Look at verse 20. He says, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Isn't that true? In that inward part of you, that new nature, that that part of the divine nature of which you've partaken, isn't there a part of you that wants to serve God and wants to obey God and wants to do right and wants to be holy? Sure there is. He said, that's what's in me. But then I have this flesh. I have this old sinful nature I'm dragging around with me. He said in verse 23, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. So in verse 22, he delights in God's word by the inward man, but in verse 23, his members, the body of flesh and the old man with its lust and sinful desires, sometimes comes to the forefront. If we're not careful, we may allow our failures and our inconsistencies and our human weaknesses to frustrate us and then defeat us. Do you understand? Now, did the Apostle Paul allow this to stop him? No. The Apostle Paul was not a sinless individual. The Apostle Paul was a man of of like passions, just like we are. And when Paul would stumble, or Paul would slip, or Paul would sin, or Paul would make a mistake, he didn't just let it frustrate him to the point of defeat. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we ask ourselves, hey, why ain't I a better preacher? And why aren't I a better teacher? And why aren't I a better parent? And if I'd only be this, and if I'd only be that, and if I'd only do this, and if I'd only do that. Many Christians are not mature enough to accept the fact that they're not perfect. In fact, Expecting perfection is a twisted way of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, isn't it? Now we strive for the mastery. But my dear friend, as long as you're walking on this soil of this planet, you're never going to be perfect and sinless. To think that I'm capable of perfection before glorification is pride born out of a misunderstanding of the natural man or ignorance of the Word of God or denying reality. And often such a person is so hard on themselves that they push themselves into stage two through self-condemnation and false guilt. Look at Romans chapter 8 verse 1. You're right there. Look what it says. When we think of this self-condemnation, the Bible says there is therefore now, read it, No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He says there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. We walk after the Spirit. 
We have a new life. We have a new nature. We have a, a new power in our lives. So what are we supposed to do with our sin and our failures and our weaknesses? Well, I'm going to take you somewhere very familiar. Go to 1 John. Go ahead over there. 1 John. Look at chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. What does the Bible say? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our all unrighteousness. Now, John is writing here and he says our sins and us. He's including himself in this, isn't he? And look what, you know, look what he says in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we do not have a sin nature, that's, the truth isn't in us. That's a lie. We, are, we have a sin nature. There are those today who would like to say we don't have a sin nature. When you get saved, the sin nature is eradicated. Well, then you've got a lot explaining to do. And then you look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's our sins of choice. We sin by nature and we sin by choice. And he said, if you say you don't have a sin nature anymore, you're a liar. And if you say you don't sin by choice anymore, you're a liar. And then he sticks right in the middle, verse 9. The remedy, doesn't he? If we confess our sin. You see, we've got to recognize our sin, and then we've got to confess our sin, don't we? And what's God? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, when we, this, this is where God tries to bring us by conviction. The Holy Spirit who lives in us, when we sin, when we do that which we would not, and we, we, we don't do that which we would, the Holy Spirit is there to convict us and make us feel guilty. Guilt today is a, is a bad word. The world doesn't like the word guilt. And nobody's supposed to be guilty. So we're changing all the terms and all the rules so that nobody feels guilty. But guilt's a good thing when it's produced by the Holy Spirit because it's designed to bring us to confession of sin. Amen. See? If I didn't feel guilty about my sin, I wouldn't go to the Father and confess it. But because I feel guilty, I feel, well, let's use the word conviction. Is that a little softer? We use the word conviction. So the Holy Spirit convicts me. I go to prayer and God cleanses me. I confess it. He cleanses it away. All right? He takes away the guilt. He takes away the conviction. False guilt is when we get up from confessing our sin and we go out and we, we carry guilt with us or we carry conviction with us that's a product of our own heart and mind, not the product of the Holy Spirit. The world tries to handle its sin by renaming it, denying it, ignoring it, or suppressing it. But that does not work. Matter of fact, when the world uses those methods to deal with their sin, it results in spiritual, emotional, mental, and even physical disorders. But the child of God is given assurance in the Word of God that there is a remedy. Amen? Amen. I want to go, let's just look real quick at chapter 2 of First John there, where the Apostle John goes on to say, My little children... So he's writing to the people of God. These things write I unto you that you what? That you sin not. That's God's standard, isn't it? Isn't that the proper standard of a holy God? He said, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. He is the satisfactory payment for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's been a price paid, friends. Go over to Romans chapter 7 again, our text, and look at verses 24 and 25. Paul the Apostle, after he went through this, this, uh, this uh, verses 17 through 23, and he comes to verse 24 and he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And here's, look what he says, I thank God through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that awesome? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, 
the law of sin. What's he saying here? Deliverance is not only available to us by rapture or resurrection, but deliverance is available to us from the unyielding power of sin over us here and now by the indwelling Holy Spirit. See, when we were lost and we were unsaved, sin had dominion over us. But now that we're saved and have been born again and have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, now sin no longer has dominion over us. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Who delivered me? Who delivers me from this body of death? What's the wages of sin? Death. And my, what's, in, what's in my members? What is in my members? The law of what? The law of sin. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Only Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can give you the victory. So if you're looking to yourself for the victory, you're going to be frustrated. If you're looking to yourself to be perfect, you're going to be frustrated. If you're looking for yourself never to make mistakes, never to mess up, never to trip up, never to foul up, then you are going to end up living in stage one a life of frustration. Let's go to stage two. Stage two is the resignation stage, stage. The resignation stage. This stage could also be called the why do I bother to try stage. It could also be called the what's the use stage. This is where the believer adopts I can't win or I can't measure up or I can't live the Christian life or I can't and you can fill in the blank. And their chronic stage of frustration advances to a stage of resignation. They just kind of give up. Why bother? Can't can't be perfect, why bother? Listen, that's like saying, you know what, I'm going to eat all the ice cream I can eat because what does it matter if I don't eat hay, right? Or, or saying, you know, or saying, you know, you only exercise one day a week. So what, what good is that going to do? So you're going to quit. You know what? You exercise one day a week. That's one day a week. You get benefit, right? Amen. Let me ask you a question: Is it better to exercise one day a week or no days a week? Okay. Sometimes we get to this resignation. Well, you know, I can't, I can't exercise every day, so I'm not going to exercise at all. I splurge and eat ice cream once in a while, so I'm just going to eat it all the time. <laughs> Resignation. I, be- I believe Elijah went through this stage. Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah, this great man of God, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, is an account of Elijah in the resignation stage. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now let me just say this before we move on. Do you hear what she threatened him with? She said, And the gods do to me, and more so. Well, so what? I mean, it's like gods with little g, you know? She's like saying the wind. She could have said the wind. The wind do so to more to me. Or the boogeyman. Or whatever she wanted to pick. Because there is no such thing. There are no gods. They don't exist. They have no power. Elijah should have figured that. He could have heard that and said, oh, big deal. I just slew all your prophets and your God didn't even answer. Your God is no God. And you're going to threaten me with a no God? Verse 3. And when he saw that, he rose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Elijah got frustrated because after all he did, things didn't turn out the way he expected. 
Jezebel the queen is now after him to kill him. I don't think that's what he expected. And so here he is, after all that, this is what he gets. But let's look at a couple of things. I want you to notice in verse 4 that he removed himself. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper, juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. He ran away into isolation, didn't he? He ran away to isolation and self-pity. Now we must be careful because at this stage we do things counterproductive to our own well-being. We remove ourselves from others. We remove ourselves from the church services. We remove ourselves from fellowship and, and other things. And this just allows us to pickle in our own juice. We go off somewhere in a corner and we, we put our, our thumb in our mouth and we sit there and we stew and we soak and we sour. Well, I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like seeing people. I don't feel like talking with people. All right, just sit there and stew then. That's really, you're really, you're, how you doing over there in the corner? You don't have to, you see, there's no, you don't have to force yourself to smile over in the corner all by yourself, do you? You don't have to force yourself to be nice or kind over there or to be civil over there in the corner all by yourself. You don't have to hear the Word of God over there in the corner by yourself. We retreat and we lick our wounds convincing ourselves that we are wise or justified in our resignation and isolation because nobody cares anyway. Even God didn't care, as far as Elijah can tell. He just stood for God. He just battled Satan for God and won the victory. And now what's happening? He's running for his life. Number two, he's feeling sorry for himself. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. What did he expect? What were his expectations? Apparently, this wasn't his expectation. And that's just the point, isn't it? His expectations, whatever they were, were not met. And so now he's feeling sorry for himself. He says this. He said, I am not better than my fathers. You know what that phrase means? It means I am not better off than my fathers, the prophets were, who got killed. My fathers, the prophets, they killed them, and now they want to kill me. I'm not better off than they are, and here I am. I'm the only one. Lord, I'm the only one that loves you. I'm the only one that's serving you. I'm the only one that's taking a stand. And I ain't better off than I'm all my other fathers. The course of events is not in our hands. And history does not flow in reaction to our deeds. And I'm afraid that Christians and even Bible college graduates today expect instant results and instant recognition. We live in an instant society, amen? I mean, if there was anything faster than Keurig, I would have it. <laughs> and as soon as it comes out, I'm getting it. That's how we are, isn't it? We don't want to wait for anything. But the world doesn't revolve around us. I believe we're seeing a generation that want to have what they see their father's generation has, but they don't want to put in the years and decades of hard work, sacrifice and saving in order to get it. Expectations. In this resignation stage, we hear Elijah, if we listen real carefully, we can hear Elijah saying, what's the use? Why try if this is all I get? Matter of fact, look at verse 14. 
And he said, I've been very jealous for the God of for the Lord God of, of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left. They seek my life to take you. That's the second time he said that. He's got a bone to pick with God, doesn't he? You think God heard him the first time? And this is all he can come up with? He's resigned, hasn't he? He just said, that's it. I gave it my best shot. This, 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 I'm done. This is all I get. Just take my life. Just kill me. We can get this way if we're not careful. You know, we can work and serve and work and serve and sacrifice and give and, and all that. And it seemingly doesn't bring us anything. Our expectations are not met. And so we resign in our hearts. We go from being frustrated with ourselves to becoming resigned that no matter what we do or why, it won't make any difference. So we settle for mediocrity for Christ at best or being a washout at worst. Now we're ready for stage three. You see, we get frustrated with ourselves. Then we resign. We give up because our expectations aren't met. And then thirdly, we go into the abdication stage. This might be called the I just give up stage. It is the stage of defeat. We see it in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, if you will, chapter 1. And look at verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things. What things? All the things in verses 5, 6, and 7. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Christians get to the point where they're blind and have spiritual Alzheimer's. Having lost sight of the blessing of God, they have forgotten the cleansing power of the blood and the forgiveness of God. And they no longer possess a sense of wonder or a spirit of thankfulness or appreciation of their salvation. The Bible says in verse 5, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. But they didn't bother with that. They got frustrated. They resigned. And now they get all the way down to verse 10. They're ready to just abdicate. The Christian has abdicated by turning over his or her life to the flesh and defeat. Peter found himself here when he said this. I go fishing. Remember that? Remember when Peter said, I go fishing? He left all at the beginning. He left all to follow Christ. And now is apparently... It's all over. Things didn't work out the way he expected, so he just figured, hey, what's the use? And went back to that which he did before he met Jesus. It is possible for Christians to be backslidden so long that they eventually begin questioning their own salvation. I've heard people say this. Well, I've heard them question if they were, you know, if they were ever saved. People ask themselves, I wonder if I ever... If I, did I really get saved? Did I really mean it? And then they start saying this. Maybe I lost it. Or maybe it didn't take. Huh? You know what? If you didn't mean it, why'd you do it? How much do you have to mean it to get saved? My Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon him, the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whosoever really means it. You know, listen, when you call on the name of the Lord to be saved, what do you think you're doing? What made you do that? You know what? I, when I spent 23 years of my life not doing that. So what made me want to do it? The light of the gospel of Christ. And we can say to ourselves, you know, well, did I really mean it? Well, if you did it, 
You meant it. Or why'd you do it? Now, if you did it because somebody told you to do it, well, then maybe you've got a problem. When I, I told you when I first got saved, I, I would go to church, I'd hear preaching, and them preachers would get up, and they'd preach, man, and I'd just sit there, and my hair would be blown in the wind, and I'd be like... <laughs> and they were done preaching, I'd say to myself, I wonder if I really meant it. And so I'd say, Lord... If I didn't mean it last time, I really mean it this time. Yeah. <laughs> then I'd be okay for a while, and some preacher would come, and I'd be holding on for dear life. And all of a sudden, at the end, I'd say, Lord, if I didn't mean it last time, I really, 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 really mean it this time. <laughs> Until one day, the Holy Spirit said to me, Did you mean it when you really, really, really meant it? Yeah. Did you mean it when you really, really meant it? Yeah. Did you mean it when you really meant it? Yeah. Did you mean it when you did it? Well, yeah. Well, that's when it took, <laughs> it took way over here. I don't know what you're doing all the way over here. <laughs> I mean, how many times you got to say really? <laughs> the thief on the cross, boom. Amen. Just like that. So, Christians go on and they just exist. No victory no power, no joy, no faith, and no hope. Sad, pitiful, defeated Christians living sin-laden lives by default in stage three because they went back to what, where they were before they met Jesus. They don't have to be back there, but that they abdicated. They abdicated. But praise God, there's one more stage. Stage number four. It's called the restoration stage. And many of God's choicest servants went through some or all of these stages and were gloriously restored. One such is in John chapter 21. Let's go there. John chapter 21, the restoration stage. John 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, uh, saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again, The second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Now these three feed my sheeps have been by many scholars throughout the uh, ages uh, referred to the three times that Peter denied Jesus. Now this is three times that Jesus has told him, get up and go. Get back. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. I want you to remember the story of this particular incident right here. You remember the disciples had been fishing all night and caught nothing? You remember? And Jesus showed up on the, on the seashore and Peter was caught on the wrong side of the boat without his coat. You remember that? He had resigned himself to being a fisher of fish and abdicated his ministry of being a fisher for men. Yet here he is, gloriously restored by the Lord to a place of ministry again. And I want you to notice that it is Jesus who came after them. Did you notice that? Did he not say he would never leave us nor forsake us? And so when we're on our boat without our coat out in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the sea doing our own thing back where we were before we met Jesus... Aren't you glad he comes after us? He didn't just leave them out there. He didn't just say, well, if that's what they want to do, then that's what they're going to do. No, he went after them. He came to them. He comes to us through his word. He comes to us through his Holy Spirit, and he comes through us to his preachers, and he comes to us through his people how many times must he come and find you on the wrong side of the boat without your coat? He only had to find Peter once. 
That's all it took. Listen, greater than you or I have found themselves in stages one through three and have been restored. David was restored. Elijah was restored. John Mark was restored. Peter was restored. The thing is to go from stage one directly to stage four, bypassing stages two and three. You hear what I said? Go right from the frustration stage to the restoration stage. Don't linger around in the resignation stage and end up in the abdication stage. You'll find yourself in the frustration stage many, many times during your journey here. But don't let your frustration turn to resignation. And God is so good. He waits for you to come to Him. But when you don't come to Him, guess what? He comes to you. you. Isn't He awesome? He comes in the midst of the sea. When you are as far from either side as the other. He comes when you have reached the point of no return humanly. Here he comes, walking on the water to your rescue, to lift you up and restore you. And I believe that's why God inspired John to write the great treatise on restoration in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through chapter 2, verse 2. Be set free from frustration. Be set free from resignation. Be set free from abdication. Just go to Jesus for restoration. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Today as we sit here, maybe there's something in your life that you have become frustrated with yourself about. And you're about to resign. You're about to say, what's the use? You need to come to Jesus right now in that stage of frustration before you end up in resignation. Maybe you're in the stage of resignation and you're about to give up, you're about to abdicate because maybe your, your, your expectations weren't met or things aren't working out the way you thought they should. And so you're saying, you know, what's the use? My friend, you need to come to Jesus today right away, before you slip into the stage of abdication. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't even know why you came this morning. You didn't feel like coming, you didn't want to come, but for some reason you came. You've given up, you've sat down, and uh, you've thrown in the towel. It's not too late to get restored. Maybe you've failed, maybe you've failed miserably. But you can be restored, Peter was, David was. Elijah was. Peter was frustrated with himself and he denied the Lord. He resigned himself to the fact that it was all over now and then he abdicated his ministry and went back to what he did before he met Jesus. Is that where you are? Maybe today you're here and you're a sinner. You're not saved. You've never been born again. There's only but one Savior. There's only one risen Lord. Jesus, which is called the Christ. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only one who could do anything about your sin. He's the only one who can give you new life and make you a new creature. He's the only one who can provide the power to be more than you are. And he's been waiting. He's been waiting for you to see your danger. And call upon him to rescue you from your sin and from its penalty in the eternal lake of fire. He has come to you today. What do you have to say? Would you call upon him right now? Would you call upon him right here? Would you, once and for all, trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior before it's eternally too late? You say, preacher, I want to do that and I need to do that. You can, right where you sit. We can pray and you can ask the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and save your soul and become a child of God right where you sit. You say, that's what I need to do. That's what I want to do. Then we'll pray together. But you need to look up at me. I want to see you. You look up at me and and wait till I see you and I'll know that you want to pray and trust Christ as your Savior today. That you realize your great need 
and you realize he's a great Savior. Anybody like that here today? You're looking up at me just because you want to pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Anybody like that here today? Raise your hand if that's what you need to do and that's what you want to do. Father, we thank you today. A lot of Christians in this room. Some are watching, some are listening. And Father, I'm sure there are many frustrated. Some resigned and some maybe have abdicated. But oh God, may you help us to come and get restored. Restored as soon as possible by the grace of God, by the washing of the blood, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, that we might go forth a force for your glory. Help us now, my Lord. Bless the invitation. We'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. That is number 160. 160. Why don't you come? Are you washed? Well, you need to come. Talk to the Lord. He knows. He cares. He's, that's why he wrote the scripture. So that you could be restored. That you could walk with him. Why don't you come? If you need to pray about something, dear Christian, the altar's open. You come and join those that are here. And if you have questions about salvation, if you're not sure... You're going to heaven someday. You come and see me. We want to help you with that, all right? As we sing on the first, you come. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You know, Elijah went on to do great things after he got restored. Peter went on to do great things after he was restored. If you need restored, it's never too late. Just come to Jesus. He already knows. He just wants to lift you up and set you on your way. You come. If you need to know about salvation and you have questions, Now's the time. This is the place to get them answered. You come and see me as we sing on the second. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Mike Quirk, would you come and close us in prayer, please? Let's bow, please, for prayer. Father, we do thank you for the message this morning. 
Thank you for the restoration, Father, in each of our lives. Help us to gain strength by what we heard, and we just pray that as we go out, Father, that um, we can make a difference for Christ in where we live, where we work, where we go to school, and Father, that we bring you as much glory with our lives in this vessel of clay. And we'll be sure to give you the glory for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with one verse of 530, 530, a shelter in the time of storm. Five three zero, oh, one verse. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in a time of storm. You are dismissed. See you tonight, 6 o'clock.